this is the end game of the regime of irredeemable fiat currency. Ultimately, the whole monetary system, you know, dies. I mean, there's no, there's no good outcome. It's only, you know, do you want destruction now or do you want destruction later? If I had to make a bet, right, for the, for the in intermediate future, my bet would be they're going to choose destruction later over destruction now. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials from March 18th through March 25th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature 2023 one-ounce silver Krugerrands at $3.10 over spot. We also have backdated one-tenth ounce gold Canadian maples at $35 over melt with a minimum order of four. And finally, we're offering our choice one-ounce palladium bars at just $119 over spot. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're privileged to have this returning guest. Keith Weiner, the CEO of Monetary Metals, joins us this Tuesday, March 19th, 2024. Keith, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Hey, thanks for having me, John, again. Actually, where you are, it, it's actually the 20th because uh, the, the uh, you're on the other side of the international dateline from us in Auckland, Australia. So thanks for making time in the wee hours of your morning to join our audience. You've spoken with us several times in the past about strategies that people can use for uh, getting some yield on their gold holdings. And you've also talked to us about why you believe many people are looking at the wrong fundamentals when they're looking at the reasons for owning gold or the price drivers for the movement of the nominal price in gold, etc. It's been uh, it's been thought provoking in the past, and I hope it will be today as well. I'm going to be asking you a few questions uh, arising from Monetary Metals uh, free ebook that you published called the Gold Outlook for 2024. That topic is certainly of high interest to our viewers and subscribers. And uh, I guess before we launch into some specific questions about that, is there any uh, context setting you'd like to do for our audience about uh, where this comes from, uh, this idea of coming out with a gold outlook uh, for the year ahead and what Monetary Metals hopes to accomplish by doing that. So we've been publishing an um, annual outlook going back to, I think, at least 2013. Um, and before, so I, I, I founded Monetary Metals in 2012. Um, and before that, I had a private uh, letter that people, you know, that heard about it said, I want to get on the list. And that kind of grew and grew that eventually became kind of the initial subscribers to Monetary Metals. And, um, you know, for, for many years, I used to write like a weekly supply and demand report for the gold and silver markets. Now I'm too busy being CEO and I just don't have the time to write as much as I'd like to. Um, so the, the thought was to have an annual that, um, you know, took the step back and looked at the, the broader, you know, the week to week, we're just looking at charts and saying, okay, here's how supply and demand changed in response to the price action or caused the price action or whatever. And, you know, it's easy to get lost in the weeds, but in an annual, you know, report, you're trying to look at the bigger picture. Um, and then we started to build, um, uh, you know, certain topics like, okay, what is, what's the wrong way to think about, um, you know, drivers in the gold market? Because there's a lot of very common, unfortunately, fallacies that uh, are out there, um, and so one one of which we call it the famous buyer fallacy. So you know the the news headline will come out, and of course everybody in the gold community will trumpet it. Bank of Ireland is buying seven tons of gold, right? Which is what is that about two hundred and ten thousand uh, odd ounces? Um, and so uh, you know the the presumption is that um, you know, basically that proves it's going to go up. And, um, you know, I looked at that and said, well, wait a minute. If there's 200, if they bought 210,000 ounces and let's say the average seller was selling 10 ounces, that means there's 21,000 sellers. Well, who's right? I mean, assuming that everyone is buying or selling purely to make a directional bet, which is, which is not true anyway. I mean, people buy and sell gold all the time for reasons other than that they have a premonition about what the price is going to do next. But even assuming that it's a directional bet only, who's right? The 21,000 people who are betting it's going to go down or the one central banker that's betting it's going to go up? And why would we necessarily think that the central banker would be right? Whereas on every other topic, the gold people rightly uh, deride and mock 
the central bankers for not having a clue, not knowing anything about anything. But when they're betting that the price of gold is going to go up, they're right that twenty one thousand dollars are automatically deemed to be wrong. And so they're right because they're famous and you can point to them and say, well, they bought, which is true. But, uh, you know, for every buyer, there's a seller. Who are the sellers? Why, why don't we have 21,000 microphones and interview them and get their take on, you know, why gold's going to go down tomorrow? And um, so anyways, we, we started to compile a list of these, um, you know, they're fun narratives. In some, case, well, some cases, they're completely, you know, fabricated or false information. This happens, you know, it happens to be true. Ireland did buy. I think it was seven tons last year. Uh, so we started to compile a list of these things. And then that, that became kind of the backbone of this uh, annual, um, uh, you know, sort of gold report. One of the things that the gold report is replete with is basically debunking and criticizing typical measures, typical uh, indicators that are not sufficiently forward looking enough. And even the, the fundamentals that go into those measures, such as GDP, quotation marks. Uh, could you tell us about the macro environment uh, as you see it? Uh, because in the in the summary of the report, it talks about the regime that we've been of for 40 years now of falling interest rates and how that has driven investment allocations in the capital markets of various types of equities and bonds and uh, precious metals, etc. Can you talk to us about this macro environment for a moment that we've been in, and whether you feel that that's going to be changing dramatically going forward? So, to, to really take the step back even farther than I, than I think you, you uh, intended, um, but to give some perspective, um, you know, the, the the macro approach that most people take is they love to look at aggregates, and my my favorite favorite way to debunk that is suppose you have you know, a restaurant and two hungry people and two steak dinners. You know, the aggregate approach would say, okay, fine, well, two steak dinners feeds two people, everything's good. But what if you had a really fat guy sitting in the restaurant eating two steak dinners and a starving guy, uh, you know, looking through the window longingly? Um, so that's the problem with macro statistics in a nutshell is it doesn't give you any information about the individual. And if there's one thing we ought to, to bloody know about economics, that's one part of my language, is that it's the individual who makes economic decisions, ultimately. You know, the economy isn't one giant lump. It's 300, what, 70 million, uh, you know, individual people making decisions, uh, you know, every day. Um, so, um, we've been in an environment where the interest rates falling and it's surreal to me how few people really acknowledge that. That's a structural systemic fall. It's not like, oh, well, you know, inflation, this or whatever, and, you know, they had to adjust. I mean, it was it was 41 years until um, they started hiking rates in 2022. And um, the question nobody asks, everybody just sort of presumes that, number one, can the state make something that isn't money, money? So the state t took something that's credit and, and actually unsound credit, irredeemable credit. Credit, that is a, credit is a promise to pay. But this particular credit has a little, that's what credit is, right? It's a, I mean, here's a piece of paper that says, I'm going to pay you. But this this particular kind of credit has a little asterisk at the bottom that says, not redeemable. That is, we'll never actually pay it. Can the state make this, you know, irredeemable credit money by by passing a law? And, um, you know, there's a fable, and I don't know whether there really was a guy named King Knut that, uh, you know, supposedly tried to order the tide to roll back. And, uh, of course, you know, he gets wet <laughs> and, uh, you know, pretty simple at the end. Um, and, you know, thus proving that you can't alter or repeal natural law by legislative law. It doesn't work that way. So can the state make this non-money thing money? Everybody accepts that. And so if you're prepared to accept that, you're prepared to accept that the state can administer, um, you know, interest rates just by, you know, a bunch of PhDs sitting in a room whether it's by political process or whether by, you know, tarot cards and astrology or whatever methodology they, um, uh, you know, may have superstitions, um, you know, come up with an interest rate. But nobody asked the question, right? So in economics, there's a concept of time preference. And that's what gives, you know, Mises talks about originary uh, interest, you know, because we're mortals, um, you know, we have time preference. We prefer something today rather than something a year from now. Because there's risk, I mean, leaving aside the risk of whether the payor will be good for it a year from now, there's the risk as to whether I will be alive a year from now. 
And if I give up everything I have today for a promise in the future, I'll cer certainly won't be alive. Um, I need to eat every day, so I can't give up everything. So there's there's a, a you know inbuilt necessity for time preference. I prefer something today rather than tomorrow. Um, so so time preference as a concept, you can almost measure it, and it's very related to the interest rate. And in fact, Mises says that basically is the interest rate. So what happens? If the government administers an interest rate, uh, attempts to administer an interest rate below time preference, nobody has asked that question as far as I'm aware in the economic literature. And so I've asked that question and the basis of my theory of interest in prices and it comes around when the government uh, tries to do this, that there are terrible, horrible, horrific consequences that come of this. But um, as even the, even the central planners admit, there are long leads and lags, mostly lags. Uh, and so what you get is people strike back. They start to try to hoard, you know, consumer goods. So this is the period of the post-war, you know, 1947, let's call it, is when it started, to 1981, where people are preferring what I call a pantry balance to a bank balance. You know, my parents used to stock up and go to the grocery store, whatever was on sale. I remember cans of tuna fish. You know, they'd buy a hundred cans of tuna fish, which would feed us for, you know, like I think every Sunday we had tuna fish and, you know, two cans or something like that. So a hundred cans would be like a year supply of this. They prefer to hold that in the pantry rather than a bank balance because the bank is paying lower interest than their time preference. Um, and then there's a ratchet effect because that drives prices up, which drives time preference up. Interest ultimately goes up through you know, other mechanisms. But unfortunately, interest still remains below time preference. And so you get this ratcheting, you know, all the way up until finally you get this incredible inversion, which we had in 1981. The interest rate spikes above time preference. But in so doing, unfortunately, it also spikes above marginal return on capital in the economy. And um, we published an article, I guess, about a year ago now. Um, my marketing team gave the headline of Keith Wiener's macro equation. Um, that wasn't the headline that I had necessarily uh, uh, attached to it. But um, I said, R is greater than I. Return on capital has to be greater than interest or cost of capital. In other words, you can't borrow 10% to open up a hamburger restaurant that generates 5%. You've you got a business. So um, eventually in 1981, they get um, interest rate above marginal return on capital. And so um, everything seizes up. You know, you get recession, which is downstream of credit, in my opinion. Um, and um, then the interest rate begins um, pathological falling uh, and, you know, was falling for 40 years. So if, if anyone thinks this is going to reverse today, in my theory, you have to ask the question, did marginal return on capital suddenly leap above, um, you know, let's call it 8%. And businesses are not borrowing at the T-bill rate. Businesses are borrowing at a spread to that. Let's call it 8%. So can people open up hamburger restaurants and factories that manufacture hamburger grilling equipment, factories that manufacture plate glass windows for hamburger restaurants and ceramic tile floors for hamburger you know, restaurants and so on? Is there a business case to borrow at 8% to open up that kind of capacity? No, we are not in that environment at all. And so um, I think we're in an environment where the demand for credit is is very soft, except when the interest rate ticks downward, and that's the same uh, place that we've been in, uh, you know, for 40 years. So I think what's going to happen is all those businesses who generate return on capital that's let's just say below um, the interest rate um, are are going to get into deep trouble sooner or later. I think the Fed has a lot of ways of kicking that can down the road, but sooner or later there's going to be really deep trouble. There will be a crisis. The Fed will be responding to the crisis uh, by lowering interest rates, as it did in 2008. Um, you know, and then you, know, you get the, the turning of the cycle. Yeah, there's been talk now for some time about the Fed saying that they're going to uh, pause on before deciding whether to continue raising rates or cutting rates. Um, <clears throat> but many are anticipating that maybe by the middle of this year that there will be some rate cuts uh, happening. Uh, what what's your view of 
the overall inflation picture? Because a lot of people have a feeling that inflation is is hurts them in their earnings, their savings, and their retirements. But uh, can you talk to us about what your view outlook is for inflation? Uh, I guess describing it classically as the money supply, or the, in this case, I guess we have to call it the currency supply versus uh, the actual economy. So um, let me just offer uh, something that any any first year science or engineering student would get. Um, and it's called dimensional analysis, which is a fancy technical word that just means if you have an equation or, or for that matter, an inequality, you want to compare two things, you have to make sure you get the units the same. So everyone's familiar with F equals MA, right, from physics. Even if you're not a physics student, you know that. Hopefully most people do. And so with that, you know, F is force, M is mass, and uh, A is acceleration. So mass is kilograms, let's say. Acceleration is meters per second squared, so meters per second per second, or change in uh, velocity, which is meters per second. So what that says is force has to be, and we, you know, in, in the metric system, force is measured in newtons, but newtons has to be equivalent to kilogram meters per second squared. Otherwise, that equation doesn't work. So, so now in, in the monetary system, we're supposed to compare the money supply to the goods supply. If I were to state it in those terms, they wouldn't quite state it that way. Um, actually, Milton Friedman comes pretty close to stating it exactly that way. The problem is the units don't work because money is the stocks. So let's take the gold standard. It just gets a little bit more abstract if we're talking the dollar standard. So in, in the gold standard, uh, money, money supply or money stocks is either ounces or tons. Take your pick. But it's the stocks. Good supply is the flows. It's, ton, let's say, tons of wheat per year. So we're trying to compare tons and saying, well, tons is greater than tons per year. You can't compare those two. That's like comparing, you know, the distance of my house to the center of Phoenix to the speed that your car is driving at. You can't, those are incomparable. So on, on a basic, like, you know, freshman 101 level course in, in uh, you know, science or engineering, you know, kid would fail the, the test if, if he made that error. And economists are building the whole theories based on this era. So um, in my theory, inflation is the counterfeiting of credit. It's the fraud you know, of, of calling and borrowing without the means or intent uh, to repay and often without the consent uh, or even knowledge of the, of the creditor. When people have a dollar, they think they own money, but actually they've lent to the bank typically or they've lent to the Fed. So they don't even know they're lending. And the and the borrower has no means or intent to repay, so that's counterfeiting, um, and I call that's inflation. But in terms of consumer prices, there are many non-monetary forces that push consumer prices up or down. Um, obviously, pushing them down is when every every business becomes more efficient every year. Everybody's in business is always constantly looking for ways to do more with less. And so, if everything else were equal, you'd expect prices to be, you know, not rapidly, but let's say gently falling. Um, but f from an interest rate perspective, a falling interest rate ha has many harmful effects. But if one was willing to overlook all the harms of a falling interest rate and one only cared about consumer prices, one should want a falling interest rate, not a rising interest rate. Because a falling interest rate is a ever increasing incentive to borrow to add productive capacity. So let's say you own a hamburger chain of uh, 50 restaurants. You've always got in your back pocket a business case to open the 51st store. And the thing that's stopping you is based on all your estimates of population and spending habits and so forth, is that revenues will be less than expenses. Well, one of the big expenses in opening a new store is interest expense. When they cut the interest rate, they cut the interest expense. So suddenly, the bottom line of your spreadsheet goes from red ink to black. And now you say, hey, we're in business. And so there's a case to borrow. So there is a, an arbitrage between the return on capital to margin and the interest rate. And a falling interest rate will drive more and more and more of this. It's not necessarily productive uh, investment. I mean, unless the appetite of the consumer for hamburgers is increasing, um, which is probably not the case, all you're doing is just creating more and more capacity and everything gets, you know, prices get soft, demand gets soft. Um, but you know, you're opening more stores and it's, it's capital churn, I call it. Um, so, so from a, from a price perspective, if you want falling prices, um, you want falling interest rates, 
rising interest rates. Take a look at all the hamburger stores that today generate return on capital less than the cost of capital. Every one of them has got to be closed if this lasts long enough. You'd have to destroy so much hamburger supply that the few survivors can raise their prices so much that they finally generate a return on capital greater than their cost of capital, which is now, let's say, 8%. Um, that would be an awful lot of destruction uh, of capacity. And with that decrease in supply, a big increase in, in prices. Now, the big story of the last four years, aside from this recent hike in interest rates, is there's some very large non-monetary elephants in the room driving prices. The first was lockdown. I mean, we just totally destroyed not only supply because you couldn't import it anymore, but we destroyed the logistics, supply chain, trucking, shipping, railroading, warehousing, freight forwarding. There were so many businesses in that ecosystem that were just absolutely clobbered. Um, and some of those businesses went out of business. And now, you know, that would have to be recreated. Fresh capital would have to be invested. Um, or they laid off, you know, huge amounts of staff. And then when things reopen, you know, it's very difficult. I mean, they basically have to grow all over again. And that's slow and requires capital and everything else. So lockdown um, was an enormous force pushing down supply and therefore pushing up prices. The reopening created a whiplash. Well, all of a sudden, these companies couldn't couldn't cope with you know the the rapid increase in demand, and so lockdown and whiplash was a massive force towards higher consumer prices. Uh, that's number one. Number two is tariffs and trade wars, and it's not just that we're tariffing you know steel imported from China and and aluminum. We're we're tariffing lumber imported from Canada. We're tariffing you know scotch imported from uh, Scotland. We're tariffing like everything. And obviously, that is a direct, I mean, if there's a 25% tariff on something, then that cost goes up 25%. That's pretty simple. You don't need a PhD in economics to understand that, right? You know, massive. And then, of course, other countries have various measures of retaliation and so on. So what you get is falling supply everywhere, um, you know, et cetera. Um, number three is green energy restrictions. Much worse in Europe than in the United States. But between... You know, I like to talk about in the UK, they had two stupid laws. One that said um, all heavy industry, including power plants that use coal or oil, have to switch to natural gas. This was like 2017. So this is taking effect a long time ago. And the other stupid law says that domestic production of natural gas, which is by fracking, fracking is prohibited. So everybody has to switch to natural gas and they can't produce natural gas domestically, which is a perfect storm. For um, the shipping and logistics disaster that was COVID and, and you know lockdown and whiplash, where suddenly you can't ship Christmas tree ornaments from China to LA, much less natural gas or anything else, and so energy became so scarce that the the price of it went up by I think a factor of fifteen at one point. So that affects not only the price of consumer energy like electricity, but the price of everything that's either manufactured or distributed with energy which is pretty much everything. So a massive non-monetary force is green energy restrictions. Unreliable energy being inserted into the grid everywhere has, has a massive ripple cost, um, much less in the United States, but you know it's affected us as well. Then you had war in Ukraine, and everybody, everybody derides Biden for trying to point to war in Ukraine as the sole source of, of inflation, so-called, which you know he's disingenuous to say that. But it certainly had an impact because Ukraine was what the second or third biggest producer and exporter of uh, wheat worldwide, and then all that production basically goes offline. Obviously, natural gas, the Nord Stream pipeline was was sabotaged. Um, tons and tons of reduction in supply of critical commodities, um, and then finally we get to the fiscal stimulus, which is not a monetary force that people are incentivized not to work either because they're getting stimmy checks or because there's a moratorium on evictions and um, there's a payment holiday on student loans and that sort of thing. A lot of people who would have worked weren't working uh, to the point where, you know, restaurants, even to this day, it's almost impossible to find, you know, find and retain staff. Um, so many of those people. Uh, but I mean, all through the, all through the labor market, 
you know, e- even at the level of accountants and middle managers, there's a lot of people that decided not to go back to work for whatever reason. Um, and those are, those are fiscal policies. So we just had a, a perfect storm of all of these non-monetary forces pushing prices up. And everyone is like trying to act like tarot card readers or palm readers. Is this going to continue or price is going to go up further? And they think that the sole cause of rising prices is monetary. And so they're trying to read into the monetary tea leaves, whether the monetary system is going to um, drive prices higher, when in fact, these are the the four elephants of the <laughs> inflationary apocalypse in the room to mix several metaphors into one bad metaphor. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the question is, is, is this going to get worse or is this going to uh, subside? My bet would be that stuff sub- subsides. We're probably not headed for lots of major new fiscal and regulatory impediments to production at this point. And therefore, um, you know, the, the rapid rise in consumer prices will, will slow to its, uh, you know, you know, sort of previous level. Yeah, in your uh, 2024 outlook, you talk about this uh, regime we've been in of falling interest rates and how that has been accompanied by, or perhaps causally uh, resulted in, reduced return on real productive uh, assets. So you've actually got poorer and poorer productivity uh, in the economy uh, because of malinvestment, et cetera. And this leading to a crisis because as uh, consumer uh, prices are going to continue to increase for all the various, you've mentioned a whole bunch more factors in your report. It's fascinating reading as well. Um, uh, This this, sort of this crisis uh, says the prices must rise massively unless the Fed reverses course. And you talk about, it says sooner or later, something has to break. It won't be any iron laws of economics and it won't be the politics of useless ingredients and regulations, etc. So two candidates remaining, the real economy and the interest rate. Can you bring us uh, into sharp focus on what you see as these two candidates for what might happen next, uh, either it, perhaps in 2024? So, you know, people are in the throes of the quantity theory of money think, okay, the fix for higher prices is higher interest rates. Well, as I, as I pointed out, the cause of higher prices wasn't lower interest rates. So therefore, higher interest rates aren't going to do anything good. And in fact, because because of my theory of interest in prices, arguing that higher interest rates means rendering cap, productive capital submarginal. That capital has to be liquidated, which means a reduction in supply. So as interest rates go up, you get less and less supply. It's a, it's a positive feedback loop. So, what, but that's going to break the economy because unlike the 1970s, you know every producer is in debt up to their eyeballs. In a falling interest rate environment. You get less and less return on the marginal dollar invested, which means means you need more and more credit. You have to lever up. You know, if you're unleveraged, you can't you can't survive in a zero or near zero interest rate environment. You know, in a ten percent environment, you don't need leverage. You're perfectly good to you know to make a twelve percent return on capital, which is about let's say the ten percent interest rate without leverage. That's fine. You can feed your family and pay your uh, you know investors and everything. But in a zero percent environment where you're making one point something percent return on invested capital, you need a lot of borrowed capital. So everybody's in debt up to their eyeballs and generating lower returns on that capital than the current interest rate. So you can either break the real economy and just ruin all these businesses and cause you know tens of millions of people to be laid off. Um, I don't think that's what's gonna. Uh, I don't think that's politically uh, palatable. Um, thank God. I mean, that would be enormously destructive. Um, but the alternative then is to go back to zero interest rates. That gets back to the Fed saying we're on hold. The Fed has issued statements, you know, late in 2023 saying, well, we will do some cuts, but not before March. I think they said now they're saying, well, we're going to pause and see, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a, um, you know, job owning, as they say, as part of the Fed's uh, policy, one of the Fed's policy tools. Um, but there's no question they're going to, either they're going to break the economy or they're going to break the interest rate. And I think it'll be the interest rate that will, uh, go under the bus, as they say. And what do you foresee based on all of the, the destructive effects that you've already described of a low interest rate, uh, environment about driving uh, out productivity and driving malinvestment and that sort of thing. What do you see ahead? If in fact it is lower interest rates again, uh, 
in our future uh, that will, will be the outcome of that. You know, I should clarify my remark earlier about thank God. I, I, I certainly don't want to give the impression that I am for any particular Fed policy. There, there's sort of in, uh, I gave a talk in, in Vienna a few years ago using the German word, which is used in chess, Zutzwang, you know, uh, which, which means um, every move you make is a bad one. You'd rather not make a move at all. But of course, in chess, you don't have that choice. Um, higher interest rates will be destructive that way. Lower interest rates will be destructive in the way you just described. There really isn't any good answer. This is the end game of the regime of irredeemable fiat currency. Um, is is you, you're forced, you know, maybe another analogy is you you've slipped into the gravity well of a black hole, and and the you know the, the closer you get, the, the steeper the slope, the higher the gravity, the faster you're accelerating towards that singularity in the middle. In theory, it's possible to escape until you get to the event horizon. And I've, I've argued in, in many of my writings over the last years that we've passed the event horizon. We're collapsing into the singularity where, you know, that's the, I also call that the heat death of the economic universe where we get less and less and less return on invested capital, which means exponentially more invested capital to get any kind of return. Um, and uh, ultimately the whole monetary system you know, dies. I mean, there's no, there's no good outcome. It's only, you know, do you want destruction now or do you want destruction later? Um, and, uh, you know, I, if I had to make a bet, right, for the, for the in intermediate future, my bet would be they're going to choose destruction later over destruction now. <laughs> I think uh, it's it's the corollary, actually, to your earlier uh, anecdote about the time preference, right? <laughs> if you want if you want a reward, your time preference is sooner. If you if you're avoiding punishment, your time preference is later. I did find the joke. I think that that time preference is quite uh, succinctly summarized in a man was speaking to God, and he asked him, "God, is it true that to you a thousand years is a minute?" That's true, said said God. And is it true that you that you gave me, if you gave me a million dollars, it's like a penny? That's true, God said. Well, you see, I'm a poor man, and I was wondering if you could give me a penny, asked the man. Sure, said God. Give me a minute. <laughs> so, time preference uh, on the one hand, but you're right. Our, so our, our keepers uh, may be kicking the can as far and as far and as far as they can down the road, but you're saying that doesn't make the outcome any better for us. So what can ordinary people do? I mean, here we are talking about it, but why are we bothering to talk about it if we're Fatal, fatally determined to, uh, you know, end up in a, in a fate that's that's no good for ourselves, our families, our grandchildren, etc. What can people do to uh, improve their positioning to in this environment uh, to come out as well as 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 is possible, given these uh, negative outcomes, this this sort of no win scenario you've described. I mean, I, I guess I'll I'll answer that kind of at the personal, you know, wealth preservation level, and I'll also answer at the sort of political policy advocacy level. So at the personal, you know, wealth level, I mean, gold is the thing that they can't debase. You know, everybody should own some gold. And, and, you know, I'm not necessarily saying everybody should go all in on gold. I do know a few people who, who say that. I don't know if they've actually done it themselves or they'd just rather everyone else do it. You know, be, be very aware of supportive mobs on the internet encouraging, yeah, 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 go do that. We're all going to be in it together, one for all and all for one. And, and they all have anonymous screen names on the internet. Be very aware of that. Um, but, um, you know, and, and monetary metals, the whole, I mean, we pay interest on gold. That's what we do. So everybody should open an account on monetary metals, of course. But um, the reason why we're doing it is we're trying to bring gold back into use um, in, in, let's just say, a more monetary way than, than it has been, which is it's been a barren asset, right? You buy it, you stick it in a drawer somewhere. and um, uh, you know, eventually the price goes up and you sell it. Um, or maybe the price goes down and you can't take it anymore and you sell it. Um, and it should be generating a return. And that's what brings it into the market. And so we're making it profitable to invest in, you know, bringing gold back into the monetary system as, as a, as a serious financial asset. And, and hopefully as a system, I'm, I'm, I'm less apt to use the term gold standard nowadays because I realize just how much baggage that term has. You know, we had a quote unquote gold standard in 1971 before Nixon killed it. That's certainly not the kind of thing I'm talking about. We had a gold standard in 1933 before FDR put the first nail or the second nail in the coffin. I'm talking about a free market and money 
um, which this country never really had, even going back to Hamilton in 1790, unfortunately. Um, but, um, you know, anyway, so, so getting interest on your gold, which means actually getting richer in, in real terms and not, uh, not just in paper terms. But um, at a political advocacy level, you know, the, the, problem, the problem is this. And I've, and I've been a veteran of um, a lot of state level lobbying and um, legislation that I came and testified on behalf of with some mixed, mixed outcomes, some successes, some, you know, didn't, some bills didn't make it out of committee or got vetoed or whatever, and also internationally, you know, spoken to members of parliament and central bank officials around the world. I had some, some non-zero success, but it's been pretty mixed and it didn't seem like it was worth my time. There's a group called, um, Sound Money Defense League, run by uh, J.P. Cortez. I'm sure you must have come across him, if not interviewed him a few times. And um, he's made a science of, of doing this and has probably had a much greater success record than, than I have and, and how he's done it and mobilized a lot more resources as well. And so gold is, is at least repealing the taxes on gold is sweeping at the state level, which is, which is only a good thing. Um, but the, but the broader the broader point I'm trying to make is that when it comes to monetary policy, most people think that what we need is better management of the dollar. That if, if the central planners of the dollar were somehow uh, smarter or wiser or less corrupt, um, had a better model or a better uh, uh, formula for how they're supposed to manage it, and so the 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 debate essentially is is a pretty narrow you know Overton window. Um, as to whether the central planners of the dollar should have, um, you know, discretion or whether they should be independent, um, you know, i.e. unaccountable or politicized, um, and, and what formula they should use. Should it be inflation? Should it be unemployment? Should it be, you know, there's, there's on the, on the nominally free market side, there's GDP targeting. So they're saying, look, instead of looking at inflation and unemployment, which is today law, the Fed is supposed to look at those two things. They should be looking at GDP growth. And um, to me, this is all just rearranging the deck chairs on the, on the Titanic. Um, I wrote an article called Sound Money is Not What You Think. And I said, um, suppose, so I said, uh, every industry every year is improving efficiency and, and therefore cutting costs. And in most industries, you know, competition means the price is marginally above cost. So if you cut cost, you cut price. Um, Every industry is, is cutting costs, and let's assume that's a two percent per annum rate. And suppose you're the central bank uh, chairman. You're tasked with um, a, a non-inflation, a disinflationary policy. So no inflation, no deflation. And so suppose it was somehow possible for you to debase the currency at a matching rate to the gains in efficiency. So every industry is, is increasing efficiency at two percent. And you're debasing the dollar at a matching two percent. So the net result was prices held steady in a flat line. It didn't go up or down. Suppose that was possible, which it isn't. Would you call that sound money? And I used a picture of, of um, Norman Rockwell, um, which was on the Saturday Evening Post, probably in the early 1950s. And it was a, a picture of a woman buying, um, I think, chicken at a, at a butcher shop. And so it was one of those, one of those scales that hangs, uh, you know, from the ceiling on a chain. And, um, un, un, the, the, uh, butcher couldn't see it, but underneath she's pushing her finger to, to lighten the, the load a little bit. But there's like a piece of butcher paper that's folded over and he can't see that. Meanwhile, he's got his thumb pushing down on it, but it's behind the meat. So she can't see his thumb. I said, suppose her up force and his down force by pure coincidence, worked out to be the same and canceled each other out. Would anybody call that a sound measurement of the weight of the meat that she was buying? No, of course not. The two cheaters, it's, it's, you know, it's not honest. So, you know, too many people are advocates of a better way of the, of the, of the Fed, you know, managing and planning and administering inflation to us. What, what we really need is a, is a movement of people that are advocating honest money rather than if sound money is, is you know, this fiat currency with zero inflation, so-called honest money would be something entirely different. It would be gold. We need people advocating gold, not on grounds that it's not inflationary, 
but on grounds that it's honest. And um, if I'm not, you know, because one of the problems um, at, at all these state level hearings, um, and I, I imagine JP Cortez would, would say the same, you get very little engagement from the public on these things. I mean, you, you always get a small but very vocal crowd who are in favor of it. I haven't seen people show up that are against removing the tax on, like from the public. Nobody shows up to lobby against it. Usually the, the voices against are either hidden, you know, lobbyists behind the scenes who don't show up at the hearing, or it's like the, the state treasurer who says, um, well, this is going to cost the state a few million dollars in, in foregone revenue. So they put a fiscal note on it or something. Um, but it's not like the public is showing, saying we're against it. But as, there's not really very much engagement from the public in favor of it either. And so the legislators are like, well, why would I, you know, spend any political capital for something my constituents don't really care about? Um, if enough people cared about it, you know, we'd get positive, you know, change in this direction. And so that's, you know, if you're asking me, what would I love to see, you know, viewers of, of this uh, show, you, you know, do at, at an advocacy level is think about, the honesty issue and, and become advocates for gold on that grounds, not grounds. Oh yeah. You know, when I was a kid, gasoline was 25 cents a gallon. Yeah, sure. And wages were a thousand dollars a year too. Um, which is the retort, right? So you have to compare well, how much did my wage go up versus how much did gasoline go up. And then some people say, well, you're ahead. And some people say you're behind and depending on which measure, you know, it all sort of bogs down in complex macro policy debate kind of stuff. But if you look at the honesty issue, you know, you come to to, to real clarity. Um, so anyways, that's my. That's actually uh, very helpful. Uh, we need honesty in every aspect of our public policy, not just our monetary, but that's a it's underneath all the other ones. So I think uh, Rafi Farber from the Endgame Investor talks about that. He says we've got to have we've we've got uh, inflation is dishonesty in our money and it reflects if dishonesty everywhere else. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, the uh, the remarkable thing is vendors who are coming out. For example, if you go to um, survivalblog.com, uh, he also has a related. Uh, it's James Rawls site. He has a related place where he sells antique firearms. And there's two prices side by side: the 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 price in Federal Reserve notes and the price in silver. And remarkably, the price in silver uh, stays the same uh, over time versus the, the, the changing price that keeps have to keep going up in Federal Reserve notes. So people who have a preference of which currency they'd rather have, which money that quote unquote money they'd rather have in their in their pocket uh, would have a chance if it was a free market. I do want to plug, it's very timely right now that you brought up the, the state's pushback. We've interviewed Patrick Holland from the Missouri Freedom Initiative many times. He's helping to provide uh, template legislation on uh, sound money to any state uh, that is interested right now uh, just yesterday Wisconsin Senate finally signed the the repeal of state sales tax on precious metals that the house had previously signed it goes to the governor now so if you live in Wisconsin get on the phone tell your governor sign the bill make it in the law let's get Wisconsin on to leave the dark side join the light side there were there were only eight uh, or nine states left that were still in the dark side there and Wisconsin needs to come into the light so uh, Honesty. Hmm, what a radical concept to bring to our public sphere. Thank you, Keith. And uh, thank you for joining us. If people want to find out more about monetary metals, where should they get connected? Our website is monetary metals with an S, that's plural, monetary metals.com. And on Twitter, I'm at real Keith Weiner. Well, Keith, uh, folks, you'll see uh, the link in the description of this video to the Monetary Metals website. And if you don't want to miss a single episode with Keith or any of our other guests, make sure you get on our free newsletter. We don't share your email address with anyone. Just go to libertyandfinance.com, libertyandfinance, spelled out, dot com. Put in your email address, click submit, make sure you confirm on the confirming email. You'll get one email in your inbox per day with our latest interviews and any weekly specials. Uh, Keith, uh, on behalf of all of our viewers, thanks for bringing us again to the, the land of thoughtfulness and uh, refreshing perspectives here on Liberty and Finance. Thanks for having me on. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials from March 18th through March 25th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature 2023 one-ounce silver Krugerrands at $3.10 over spot. We also have backdated 1 tenth ounce gold Canadian maples at $35 over melt with a minimum order of four. And finally, we're offering our choice one ounce palladium bars at just $119 over spot. 
To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.